So when I grew up, my family loved listening to and watching Broadway musicals. One of our favorites was West Side Story. You may know the, the tale of West Side Story. It's kind of Romeo and Juliet meets sort of New York City in like the 19, I think, 50s or 40s or something like that. Basically, the story revolves around two kind of rival gangs, the Sharks and the Jets, and they battle it out in these wonderful dance battles. <laughs> Okay, why am I talking West Side Story? Well, because the lesson for today is about citations. And you see, all the various academic disciplines in the university have their own way of citing things for academic papers. It's kind of like sharks and jets and I don't know, what other, what other gangs you can think of. For historians, the way that we cite things is according to the Chicago Manual of Style, aka Chicago Style. This lesson is basically going to be your initiation into the sort of gang of historians, the, the sharks, the historical sharks, I guess, um, by way of learning the Chicago Manual of Style. All right, let's get going. I'm not gonna lie, this is gonna be a pretty hefty lesson. Uh, and it's pretty technical too, so I'm gonna try to break it up as much as I can and uh, throw in a little bit of entertainment to keep your interest. In this lesson, we're going to look at citations kind of in four different ways or in four different sections. First, we're gonna talk a little bit, very briefly, about why we have citations. What's the big deal about citing our sources? Second, we're going to start to look at how to cite sources according to the Chicago Manual of Style. We're going to focus first on, um, on secondary and tertiary sources, how to cite those. Third, we're going to turn our attention to primary sources. How do we cite primary sources according to the Chicago Manual of Style? And then fourth, we're going to do kind of, or I'm going to talk a little bit about some last suggestions and tips and little bits and bobs that you need to know. Okay, first things first. Why do we cite and what does it look like to do citations in Chicago style? Okay, the first thing that we need to figure out is why we do citations at all. Why is this such a big deal? Well, we cite for a few different reasons. First is kind of academic honesty. We need to give credit where credit is due and citations are the way that we do that. Second, citations assure readers of our papers and articles and things about the accuracy of our facts. You see, the reality is that a citation is a kind of um, breadcrumb trail, right? That people can go back to and check to see if you're telling the truth about the things that you're saying in your paper. So any paper with citations immediately makes a reader feel far more assured about what's being said. Third, citations are really important research tools. They help readers extend and follow the research that's in an article. You're going to see this when you work on your historiographic essays, that citations are kind of the beginning point for doing your own research. So now that we know why we cite, let's talk a little bit about when we cite. What are the times that we have to add citations into our papers? Well, the general principle here is just whenever you use something that you got from somewhere else. If you got a bit of information from some book or article or something, then you need to tell the reader where you got that from. In practice, what this looks like is any time that you add direct quotations, any time that you paraphrase a passage from another source, or any time you're summarizing, say, the argument of another book or an article or something like that, then you must put a citation in. Okay, we know why, we know when, now let's look at where do we cite. Well, according to the Chicago Manual of Style, citations happen in footnotes and endnotes. 
So this makes it very different from, say, MLA style or APA style, where there are parenthetical citations in the actual text. In Chicago style, we put all of our citations down at the bottom of pages or at the bottom or in very ends of papers and articles uh, in footnotes and endnotes. We also add citations to bibliographies and or works cited pages at the end of papers. So citations show up in these two places, footnotes or endnotes and bibliographies and works cited. Okay, second thing to know about Chicago style citations. They come in kind of two forms, right? Remember that there are two places where you see citations. You see them in notes and you see them in bibliographies. And the form of citations, right? What the formatting of each citation looks like depends on where you see it. So for example, in footnotes, you will find that, um, that citations show up um, because they are referring to specifically quoted or paraphrased or summarized documents in your paper. And the general rule to think about with citations in footnotes is that when you are citing something in a footnote, usually uh, the first name comes first, there are lots and lots of commas, and there are parentheses. I know that sounds really silly, but just think first name first, commas, parentheses, and that's going to help you remember how to do citations in footnotes. Okay, second is citations in bibliographies. Now, when you cite something in a bibliography, more often than not, you're citing the whole work, not just the specific, say, page that you're quoting from. So, citations look different in bibliographies. And the rule here to remember is that last names come first. That's because bibliographies are often organized in alphabetical order based on the author's last name. So, the last name always comes first. In bibliographies, citations always have more periods and less or, or fewer parentheses. So again, this doesn't make a lot of sense right now, but you're going to see it later. Last names first, periods and parentheses for bibliography. All right, now that we know why to cite, let's start to look at how to cite things according to the Chicago Manual of Style. We're gonna begin with secondary and tertiary sources. All right, let's get into it. So let's look at how to cite things according to the Chicago Manual of Style. And we're gonna begin with secondary and tertiary sources. Why? Because if you learn the forms for secondary and tertiary sources, you're going to know the kind of foundation of pretty much all citations in Chicago style. So it's best to learn these first and then kind of to move to primary sources next. And the way we're going to do this is by uh, giving a sort of homage to one of my favorite TV shows, Parks and Recreation. Okay, let's start with books. All right, like I said before, there are two forms that we have to know for each citation, right? We need to know how to cite things in footnotes and we need to know how to cite things in bibliographies. So for books, um, citations in footnotes look like this. Here's a book that I made up. You ready? Leslie Nope, Avoid Salad and Other Disgusting Things. Pawnee, Indiana, Sweetums Press, 2014. And that last number is the page, page 13. Okay, let's begin by just identifying what's in a citation. Well, first things first, we have the author of the book. That's Leslie Nope. Then we have the title of the book. And notice that the title of the book is in italics. Italics and underline are the same thing. You could use underline, you could use italics. It doesn't matter which, but titles of books are always in italics or underline. Then we have essentially the publication information about the book. And it always takes this same form. It's place, colon, press, comma, year. Place, colon, press, comma, year. Notice that place is always a city. Sometimes it has a state with it, um, but it's always a city. So you wouldn't just put, I don't know, Indiana there. And notice also that in footnote form, the publication information is in parentheses. Remember our rule from before, right? Footnotes love parentheses. Here you go. This is why. And then finally, you have the page number from the, say, quotation that you took from that book, right? Here it's page 13. Okay, what's different in bibliography form? Well, you'll notice that the first and last name of the author have swapped. Now, nope comes first. Notice also that instead of a comma after the name of the author, we have a period. Remember our rule from before, right? Last name first and periods. The title looks the same. It's still in italics, but there's a period after it. Again, remember our rule from before and no parentheses around the publication information. Finally, you don't have a page number here because in bibliographies, you're not citing the specific pages you consulted. You're just citing the works that you used. Okay, but here's the issue. Sometimes books have uh, editors or translators or other people involved in the creation of the book. So what do we do if we have an editor or a translator? Well, here's another book. Don Amigo, Treat Yourself, A Guide to Live in That Life. Trans, Genuine, shout out to Genuine. 
Seattle, Don't Touch My Benz Press, 2016, 100. DJ Butch is in the building. Here to announce that Tom Haverford is in the building. Oh, what you want to? Donatella, T-Mobile. Three words for you. Treat yourself. Treat yourself 2011. Okay, this is the footnote form, and notice a few things. Once again, the author is there first. First name first. The book's title is in italics again. But here's the additional thing. If there's a translator to the book, you put in here T-R-A-N-S, that stands for translated by or translator, and then the name of the translator. In this case, it's shout out to Genuine. Once again, publication information is all there. Place colon press comma year and the page number. In bibliography form, the same information is there. It's just formatted slightly differently. Again, reverse the name order put periods in, but then look at the translated part, right? Instead of putting the abbreviation for translated by, you put translated by genuine. And then the publication information with no parentheses. Treat yourself. All right, books done. Now let's look at journal articles. Remember our main forms of secondary sources are our Bay books, articles, and essays. So we've done books. Now let's look at articles. Here is a fictitious article, Ann Perkins, jogging. I know it keeps you healthy, but God, at what cost? I mean, I was jogging. I hate jogging. <laughs> Jogging's amazing. Jogging is the worst, Chris. I mean, I know it keeps you healthy, but God, at what cost? In Nursing Quarterly, 15, that's the volume number. Number two, that's the issue number. 2020, colon 89. Okay, let's identify a few things here. First, there's the author's name, Ann Perkins. The title of the article, that's what's in quotation marks there. For journal articles, the title of articles are in quotation marks, and the title of the journal is in italics or underline. Then finally, if it's a journal, then that means it's a serial production, so it means that it has volume numbers and issue numbers. The volume number is just a number that comes straight after the title, that's the 15 there, and then usually the issue number follows with the abbreviation NO period to signify issue number. And final weird thing about journal articles, they always have a colon before the page number. Why? I don't know, but that's how it's done. Okay, notice in bibliography form, again, same sorts of changes, right? Periods go in, um, reverse name order, uh, and at the very end, instead of just citing the one page of the article, you cite the entire pages of the, of the article, right? So um, in this case, the, the article goes from page 81 to page 99. That's the first page and the last page. Okay, how about essays? Remember what an essay is. An essay is essentially a chapter of a book or a sort of section of a book. These ones are kind of complicated, so stick with me, all right? Here is an example of a totally fake essay. John Ralphio Saperstein, K to the N to the O-P-E. She's the dopest little shorty in all Pawnee, Indiana. Oh, uh oh, K to the N to the O-P-E. She's the dopest little shorty in all Pawnee, Indiana. In Entertainment 720, an anthology edited by Tom Haverford, Columbia, South Carolina, Rent a Swag Press, 2011, page 40. Okay, again, let's identify the things that are here. First, the author of the essay. That's John Ralphio. He's the worst. Then we have the title of the essay, K to the N to the O-P-E. And then we have this word in. That's just to signify that it is an essay or a chapter in a book. Then comes the title of the book, Entertainment 720, an anthology. Notice again that titles of books always in italics or underline. This book has an editor. It's edited, ED period, by Tom Haverford. And then we have just the publication information of the book. Same form as before. Remember, place, colon, press, comma, year. In bibliography form, all the same information, slightly different format. Switch those names in the front, right? Add periods in after the author's name and after the, uh, the title of the essay. And notice now that in is capitalized, just remember it by, you know, it's following a period now instead of a comma. So whenever words follow periods, they're always capitalized first. And note here, instead of the abbreviation ED period for edited by, we, j we have the full edited by Tom Haverford. The trickiest thing to remember about essays in bibliography form is that the full page numbers, the, the, the page range of the essay, does not come at the end. It comes before the publication information. That's the 36 to 41 there. That's all the pages, the first page and the last page of the entire essay. Why does it go there? Again, I don't know. I have no clue. But that's the way it's done, so that's the way I have to teach you. 
Okay, the last thing we're going to look at is encyclopedia articles. Generally, in like research papers, you don't really cite encyclopedia articles. You'd want to cite just like secondary and primary sources alone. But for some of the papers in this class, and maybe for other reasons, you'll need to know how to cite these tertiary sources too. So here's an encyclopedia article. Andy Dwyer, Network Connectivity Problems. In Encyclopedia of Human Health, accessed March 9th, 2023, and then a big long web URL. If for some reason this encyclopedia article didn't have an author, you'd format it like this. You'd put the, the title of the encyclopedia and then SV, um, which I don't know what that stands for exactly, but it basically means, you know, refer to this article, right? Network connectivity problems and then all the rest of the stuff. So what do we have here? We have the author of the encyclopedia article, that would be Andy Dwyer. We have the title of the article and then in and the title of the encyclopedia. And if you are accessing this encyclopedia by way of a database, which for, we're probably going to do because you're probably going to use Credo quite a bit, you need to give an access date, like when you actually access that uh, database, and the URL for the specific article. When you throw this into a bibliography, here's where it's kind of uh, weird. Instead of citing specific encyclopedia articles in the bibliography, you just cite the, the encyclopedia themselves. And you're going to cite it basically like a book, with the exception that uh, this book doesn't have one author, it has one sort of overall editor. So here, the Encyclopedia of Human Health apparently was edited by Jerry Gergich. Shout out to Jerry. Okay, secondary and tertiary sources done. And like I said before, these are kind of the, the foundations for citations in Chicago style. So a lot of the things we're going to talk about next are kind of variations on these standard forms, the forms that we just talked about. So now let's turn our attention to primary sources. All right, now it's time for primary sources. Now remember what I said before. The citations for primary sources are largely kind of built on the forms that we saw for citations of secondary and tertiary sources. That's why I did those first, and now I'm moving to primary sources. And the thing to kind of start with to understand how to cite primary sources is to remember the forms of primary sources or, or essentially where we find primary sources, how we access them now. If you remember from a previous lesson, there are kind of three places where we find primary sources. The first is publications. Oftentimes primary sources are in, say, uh, collections of documents or in their own sort of edited, um, uh, you know, or edition of, modern edition of a, of a past primary source. We also find primary sources in archives. This could be physical archives or it could be digital archives, but lots and lots of primary sources live in archives. Then finally, we find primary sources in databases. Remember, databases are just sort of um, aggregations of digital archives that are usually focused on one specific topic. The one from the image here that I have is, is a database called African Diaspora, 1860 to the present. And again, what it does is it looks at lots and lots of digital archives that all have materials on the African diaspora in the modern period. Okay, so it's important to remember these three places that we access primary sources because it affects the way that we cite them. We will cite things in publications differently from what we from things that we find in archives and databases. So let's start with primary sources that we find in publications. First and foremost, if the publication if the primary source is just its own edition, right? If it's just a whole work, say like a, a novel, right? A modern edition of a novel or something, right? Or I don't know, like a Virgil's Aeneid or something like that. Then you just cite it like a book. Remember how to cite books from before? Here's an example. April Ludgate don't try to bond with me. Washington, D.C., Champion Press, 1999, page 44. Remember, this is exactly what the citation for a book looks like in footnote form. No problems whatsoever. If you have a book in your hand, even if it's a primary source, you're just going to cite it like a book. But a lot of times you'll find primary sources in like readers, primary source readers or anthologies. And here you're essentially going to um, cite the primary source as if it were an essay or a chapter in a book. So let's pretend that Don't Try to Bond With Me was a, you know, I don't know, a, an essay, or there was an excerpt or something from the novel in a reader. Then it would look like this. April Ludgate, Don't Try to Bond With Me, in Sarcasm, an anthology, edited by Tinnifer. Eagleton, Indiana, Fantastic Press, 2021, 44. So what you can see here, right, is that this is, say, an excerpt from the larger novel, right? And it's included in an anthology of documents all on, I guess, sarcasm. And how do you cite it? You cite it exactly like an essay. Okay, what if we turn to databases? How do we cite things in databases? Well, it sort of depends on what form it takes, right? And what kind of primary source it is. 
If it's a published primary source, right, that you found in a database somewhere, then you're going to cite it as the the published form, right, the, the published thing that it is. Brundage's appendix and Turabian um, are going to have examples of all the various types of primary sources that you can find and how to cite them. But I'll give you sort of two examples here. The first is a newspaper article, Ron Swanson, skim milk, water that's lying about being milk. This is in the Pawnee Times, March 2nd, 2012, section C, page four. So that's how you cite a newspaper article. You have the author of the article, the title of the article, the title of the newspaper, and notice that's in italics. And then the date of the newspaper issue, right? And whatever referencing information you have, whether it be a page number or a section and page or whatever you, you have from that newspaper. But notice if you get it from a database, you have to tack on the name of the database at the very end. That's what America's Historical Newspapers is. It's a name of an actual database. You won't find the Pawnee Times there, but it actually exists. Again, if we have, say, a magazine article, it looks very much the same. So here we have Tom Haverford, Chicky Chicky Parm Parm, in Cook's Illustrated, September 2017, page 17, and then American Memory. So what is this? This is the author of the article, the magazine article, the title of the article, the title of the magazine, that's Cook, Cook's Illustrated, again, real thing, and the issue of the magazine, which usually is like a month and year. Then finally, we have the page number. And once again, if you find it in a database, you just have to tack on the name of the database at the end. So here it's American Memory. But what if you find a primary source in manuscript form, either in a physical archive or a digital archive? Now, I'm not going to lie. This is when it gets really, really confusing. Archives organize things in lots of different ways. It's all kind of messed up. And frankly, Chicago Manual of Style doesn't have one very, very specific way of citing archival documents and manuscripts. But it does give us a few sort of general rules of things that we should have in there. Let me give you an example. How about a diary? Here's Mona Lisa Saperstein's diary, entry for January 4th, 2020. And then in the citation, we also have Saperstein Collection, Pawnee Municipal Archives, Pawnee, Indiana, Box 15, File 2, Folio 6R. Okay, what is all this? Well, this is basically just information from the archive itself on how to identify that document and the, the pages within that document. So what the Chicago Manual of Style says for manuscripts in archives is essentially this. Try to provide the following things. First, the author of the document. That's Mona Lisa Saperstein. Second, either a title of the document or what kind of document it is. Here, Mona Lisa Saperstein apparently didn't title her diary, so we just identify it as diary. There are lots of other things that you could find in a physical archive. It could be a grocery list. It could be a uh, memorandum. It could be anything, really. You put whatever the form of that thing is right there. Third, you put whatever, um, whatever date of creation uh, you have for that document. And then finally, you follow that up with the archive information, the way that the archive kind of references and catalogs that document. Usually that includes a collection, the name of the archive, the place of the archive, and then whatever sort of organizational structure that they have. Lots of times it includes boxes and files and uh, manuscripts will sometimes be labeled by folio, not by page. If it's in a digital archive, you do largely the same thing with the addition that you have to also provide the URL at the end of where you found this on the internet. So for example, if you're citing a letter, you generally generally format it like this. Ben Wyatt to Chris Traeger, October 30th, 2016. Kid Mayer Collection, Dunshire Library, Partridge, Minnesota, document 35, and then the website. So what do we have here? With a letter, you always provide not just the author of the letter, but also the recipient of the letter. You always put Ben Wyatt to Chris Traeger. When you put it like this, the, the reader automatically knows that it's a letter. If it says Ben Wyatt to Chris Traeger, we know that it's a letter. So you don't have to put in letter there. Next comes the date of when the letter uh, was written. And then all the archival information, right? The collection, the archive itself, the place of the archive, and any sort of organizational numbers or whatever we have to organize it. Here we have a document number. But again, if you found it in a digital archive, then you got to put the URL of, the, uh, of where you found it as well. Okay, so now you know why we cite, and you know how to cite tertiary, secondary, and primary sources. To end this video, I want to go over a few little last tidbits, little bits and bobs that you need to know to do Chicago-style citations correctly. Look, this is a lot. I know this is a lot. It's a lot to memorize all of this stuff. And the fact of the matter is that you're just going to have to practice this a lot. You're going to have to get it wrong quite a few times for it to stick in your brain. 
But I want to end this with a few sort of final tips and tidbits, a few last things that you need to know to do citations via the Chicago Manual of Style well. First, the Chicago Manual of Style has what's called short form as well. So in reality, all the citations that we talked about before, all the long, you know, uh, author and title and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all of that is just for things that you cite the first time in a footnote. When you're citing in a footnote, uh, uh, the same source over and over and over again, you're not gonna provide the entire full citation every single time. Instead, after the first time, you're going to provor or you're going to, um, you're going to put in a citation that is in the short form. The short form is just the author's last name, an abbreviated title, and the page number. So for a book, it would just be, nope, binders are great, 55. And every citation you have of that book from this point forward will just be in this tiny little abbreviated form. That makes it a lot easier. Okay, second thing. Sometimes you will only find like quotes from primary sources by way of another source. Now, this is a very much an exceptional circumstance. If you ever want to find like a quote that you see in one source that actually comes from another source, then, you know, Brundage's golden rule would say, go find that other source. Once you find that other source, you can cite it directly and you're good to go. But if, for example, that first source, you know, um, or the original source doesn't actually exist, right? And the only way you have that quotation from that source is by way of another source. You can use this form called quoted in. It's a citation style in which you show um, what the citation is, like where the actual quote, say, comes from. But you also recognize that you didn't see that specific document. You saw another document. It's really quite simple. You would just provide basically citations to both of the sources, the source where the quote comes from first, and then quoted in, and then the citation of where you actually saw it. Again, this should be an exceptional thing. Most of you should not use this at all because if you ever are looking for the source of a quote, then you gotta go find the original source. That's the best thing that you should do. But in extreme circumstances, here's how you do it if you can't track down the original source. Okay, third. For political documents, they all have their own form. They're really annoying. Um, so if you're citing laws or um, congressional records or things like that, the, the thing that you really need to do is you just need to consult either Turabian's Manual for Writers or the Chicago Manual of Style itself um, to get the specifics on how to cite those things. If you have questions about it, come talk to me. I'll help. Okay, finally, for visual materials, we didn't go over sort of what you do with, say, an artifact. In fact, citing visual materials is really, really easy. Usually all you need to provide is the name of the artist, the title of the, the piece, the date that it was created, the form of wh whatever form it takes, and then the location of, of where it exists now. So I'll give you an, uh, an example here. Um, let's say that uh, we have a painting by Andy Dwyer, right? Uh, the painting is titled Bye Bye Little Sebastian. It was painted in 2016. It's an oil on canvas, because, you know, Andy Dwyer, very classy. And it currently exists in the Pawnee Art Museum in Pawnee, Indiana. That's how you would cite it. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Okay, that's it for this lesson, but I want to kind of end by saying a few things. First, this was just kind of the, the very surface of citations according to the Chicago Manual of Style. The reality is that the Chicago Manual of Style is really big. It's got lots and lots of details for all sorts of different documents and um, things that you might find and want to cite. So. The reality is that while this lesson will get you most of the way there for your papers, um, really in this class and going forward, the best thing to do, honestly, is to get a copy of either the Chicago Manual of Style, if you want like the big hefty one with everything in it, or actually um, better, to just get a copy of Kate Turabian's Manual for Writers. This is like the sort of abridged version of the Chicago Manual of Style. And it has really details on everything you might need to know and, and about citations and how to do them. So I really recommend that you get a copy of this just so you can have this for the rest of your time um, in college, right? For all the papers that you're going to write from this point forward, Turabian's Manual of Style is going to help out. The second thing I want to say is that Learning citations is um, 
a part of professionalization. It's a part of showing that you understand how historians do things and why they do them the way that they do them. Um, so getting your citations right is actually a really big deal. It sort of um, shows you to be a responsible historian and a responsible researcher. So don't take this lightly. Work hard to kind of learn these forms and to get citations right in all your papers. You'll see that people really appreciate it and professors, when they look at your papers, will be really impressed. Okay, finally, I want to end with this. I know what you're probably thinking throughout this whole lesson. You're thinking, why do I need to learn this? It's already in a book. I can just model the forms that uh, the book have, whether it be, you know, Turabian or the back of Brundage's book in the appendix, where he has examples of all the things that I've talked about. Well, the answer I have sort of relates to why we learn, say, I don't know, basic math and arithmetic. Um, we all have calculators, right? And lots of like hard arithmetic we can do via a calculator and get it right. Um, so you might think that you don't need to know how to add or subtract or multiply or divide because, you know, you always have a calculator with you and the calculator can do it for you. But the reality is that's not how life works. The reality is that you often need to just sort of add things very quickly in your head. And I would argue it's the same thing with citations. It's best to know sort of how to cite things and, and have that knowledge in your head so that when you go and, and look at a, a citation guide or maybe you rely on Zotero or some citation software to do uh, automatic citations for you, you can go and check and make sure that they're right. The reality is that every student I've seen that's relied on citation software has always gotten citations wrong because the software depends on what you input and uh, where you input what you input. And there are lots of sort of variables there. And the fact of the matter is that if you don't already know how to do it in your head, then you won't know how to double check these citations that uh, say a computer does or something like that and see if they're right. So just trust me on this. Learn how to cite these things, memorize these forms, and it will really help you out with papers in this class and going forward. Okay, that's it for now. Good job staying with me this whole time. I'm very impressed. <laughs> I'll see you in class. Good job.